All right, guys, uh, we got uh, John Seidel here. So, John, why don't you introduce yourself? All right, so John Seidel um, used to be a state patrol inspector for 12 years. Then I was an investigator with the feds for about eight years. I was a hazmat agent with the FAA. So 23 years, I was a government regulator. And I was also in the, uh, the Army, too. So I'm a veteran, so served the country. So that's great. Um, mm -hmm. Now I'm a DOT consultant, and I own Trucking Winds. So www.truckingwinds.com. What is this? It's an online training portal. I'm the DOT coach. If you want to win at the game called trucking, you need a good coach, right? And you may have a lot of good teammates and team members, but you need someone to help coach you. So that's the goal of Trucking Wins. I had a bunch of customers always asking me about the same questions, learning the same training. And I thought, you know what? Why not make some training videos? And then I put them on a website. You can go there and check it out. I do training every month, add new content, and then I have this thing called Trucking Wins Monthly. You get live access to me at least once a month on a podcast similar to this, but instead of us talking, the customers can ask questions. They can interact. They can bring up scenarios to me and I answer all their questions. So truckingwins.com, really excited about it, and I'm excited to be here with you guys too. Yeah, we're going to also put the link right here. All right, so... Uh John is a guru of industry, I guess, DOT insurance related. That's your your niche. That's my bread and butter right there. And uh, I've seen some of your videos. Very, very impressive. I We actually did send a couple of people from the office to one of your seminars. All right. Yeah. Everybody came back very impressed. Yeah. Uh, so glad to know you. I got I got next because I haven't had a chance to go, but I think I could learn something. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. That's true. <laughs> yeah. So my goal is whenever I do these seminars, whenever I come into these sessions, I want people to join this call or come in the room having a certain level of information in their head we have a conversation we chat we talk they leave and they're like man that wasn't a waste of time i actually learned quite a bit in that session so whether it's your youtube channel trucking wins a live seminar i'm just here to try to educate people so this is a good opportunity for you guys to get a preview we got some questions lined up we're just gonna have some regular dialogue trucking dialogue and um they get to see your response and and, and probably get learn something all right, so yeah. maybe let's start with the uh, insurance portion. Yeah, yeah. And then sure. we'll go to the most important option. <laughs> <laughs> So, right. I, so I'm actually an insurance agent on top of owning Trucking Winds. So I can write insurance policies, auto liability, physical damage, cargo, general liability, property, owner-operator programs, OCAC, NTL, PD, excess policies, understand auto liability policies with mileage reporters or revenue reporters or units or scheduled. Um, what's a captive? A captive is an alternative risk program. So no matter what your insurance question is, I've been doing insurance and DOT for quite a bit so we'll cover all those areas and you said insurance first so let's go yeah so Christian that's your yeah niche. so so remember guys we got a bunch of guys that are out there at different levels of the game yep. multiple trucks some guys getting started one truck armies and so forth so um, we're just gonna you know let's let's hit the first ball here does a non-reportable claim stay tight to that driver all right. So let's say a driver's involved in a crash. The driver's name is associated at that crash with that insurance company. If it turns into a real bad claim, it is possible for that insurance company to remember his name. It's not the most common thing that you'll see where the insurance company has this big black list of drivers that can't get insured by their company. But every once in a while, you may run into it where they're like, hey, we know about that guy. But if the claim wasn't through that insurance company, another insurance company wouldn't know they don't talk to each other but what i have seen too is sometimes a trucking company will have their own dot number their own mc number they'll run into a problem with an insurance company and they'll let their authority drop and then they say i'm just going to be an owner operator and i'm going to lease on to another trucking company well if that trucking company they lease on to is the same insurer that they ran into problems with their own company these insurance companies can tie the two together and say hey i remember when you owned a company and you didn't and pay your bills now you want to lease on with this other one uh, we don't know about that but it's kind of like a needle in the haystack it's not the most common but it's possible okay so hey that would kind of uh explain a, an experience i had where an owner operator went from seven trucks to one man army 
a nuclear verdict is what put him out of business. But again, then he doesn't operate as his original business name and has to change it up because of something like that. So yeah. that one kind of hit home. Here's uh here's a here's here's a here's a constant question that is so such, such in the gray and everybody has a misunderstanding. Bobtail versus NTL. What the hell is the difference? Is there a difference? What does it mean? I got you. So it's tell you, people misunderstand this all the time. They interchange these words as if they're the same, and they do because they are pretty much exactly the same. The only problem is NTL is the legal term, non-trucking liability. It's liability insurance, mostly up to a million dollars, when you're not trucking, right? Bobtail is like some fake made-up term that they've just coined to explain what NTL is. Because if you say, do you have NTL driver or a person might say, what are you talking about? But then bobtail, they know what that term means. But in essence, it's the same exact insurance. It's when you're driving a truck, not in the furtherance of a commercial business, nor for compensation, nor, um, and it's just your personal property. A good example I use is, let's say you're sitting at your house and your daughter calls from high school and says, dad, mom didn't pick me up. Can you come get me? And he goes out to start his pickup truck and it's dead. It won't start. So he jumps in his semi tractor and he starts to drive to the high school and he crashes into someone. That's not trucking. That's him transporting personal property, not in the furnace of a commercial business, nor for compensation. That is exempt from this green book, meaning he's not subject to any of these regulations because he's not in commerce. He's personally going to pick up his daughter. That's where NTL, non-trucking, because he's not trucking. That's when it comes into play. And then people just use that term as bobtail. Yeah. And so, and so that's where, because people are going to challenge this. They're going to go to Google and True North, First Guard, you name it, any major insurance company mm -hmm. on their website, even OIDA. They're going to have the definition of bobtail, the definition of NTL, but that's straight from the book right here is the explanation mm -hmm. of what actual NTL is. So yep. same difference. Yeah. I kind of equated this to like, you know how you have a box of Kleenex? Well, it's really not Kleenex. It's tissue, right? We just interchange the term Kleenex with all tissue. Well, it could be Walmart tissue. It ain't Kleenex. It's <laughs> yeah. just tissue. So NTL is like tissue. That's the legal term. That's what everybody recognizes it as. But then some people say, hey, get me some Kleenex, right? So after it, was, after it was marketed long enough, it becomes whatever you market. It becomes uh, the norm. Yeah. <laughs> like everybody calls it that. Get me a Coke. You mean Pepsi? No, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> or get me a soda. <laughs> yeah, get me a soda. Yeah. Yes. Here we go. All right. So next one, it's, uh, I get a lot of phone calls on this uh, and it's, it's, it's guys with big dreams and, and looking to change industries and get into, into yep. a new field. Under one year experience, why is it so hard to get insurance? These guys feel lost because no company is actually mm -hmm. going to take them. Yeah. Then they'll say, hey, man, I'll just buy my own freaking truck and do it all on my own because nobody's willing to take me. OK, elaborate on that under one year. What, what should a guy do? And, you know, what is your point of view from the insurance world? Well, the good insurance markets, the ones that are going to give you the best rates, the best claims handling, be the most flexible in your operations as it relates to a professional company running professional drivers and hauling freight. Right. The good insurers run away from anybody with generally less than two years of experience. And they want you 23 years old. They don't want your MVR cluttered with crashes and violations. So they put stipulations on there. Some markets hold to it really, really, really tightly. And they're like, under no circumstances. Some of the good markets might give you a one-off here and there if you explain that maybe the driver was a farm boy in the past or maybe he had some legitimate experience overseas, which is hard sell. You might get one or two exceptions to that. But hard rule, good insurance company, really quality good luck getting a bunch of drivers under two years now what do some companies do and it ain't illegal we talked about this yeah you can go to a market like a progressive a progressive will let you have a brand new driver right out of school and they'll insure that driver under a trucking company so if you have one trucking company over here with 80 drivers good market good quality rates good customer flow great csa scores low loss rate
ratio in crashes. You may not want to or you won't be able to add new drivers to this one. So start a second company. It is not, everybody listen, it is not illegal to start a second trucking company as long as there's a legitimate legal purpose for it. And you're not running away from a bad rating or high CSA scores or fines and penalties or not a service order. I used to be an investigator. I'd go to companies and I would see two companies there. They had legitimate reasons. What would be the legitimate reason to have a second company with Progressive? You can hire a brand new driver. You can coach them. You can teach them. You can mentor them. You can take your major company where you've learned everything over the years and take that knowledge and guide the next generation of truckers through the trucking company that's with an insurer that allows for it. Then when you graduate them to two years of experience, you move them over to your better company. And you use this company as like a development feeder trucking company insured by someone that's willing to let it happen. Now, let's be real. You're going to pay more. Yeah. For the trucking company over here with the younger drivers. But why should you not have the opportunity to put your big trucking company with a better market just because a few drivers you want to mentor and grow in this industry? We're getting old as an industry, right? I agree and we that. need younger drivers and we need companies just like yours to help guide and develop and grow these drivers into the next generation of professional truck drivers. And without this flexibility of being able to hire drivers younger, how do you do it? Yeah, is that is that going to be a similar formula to like how those big boys handle it, like the the Martins and stuff that they have the school and then these are they self insured or how that or it's yeah. similar to what you described? How do they handle it? All right, so they handle it because they're bigger. If they're self insured, no insurance company's telling them who they can or can't hire. Yeah. So a large big company with self insurance is an absolute advantage over the small company that's limited to the two years of experience. So how do you get drivers with two years? You almost have to go to the big boys and steal them, right? <laughs> <laughs> like a brand, they go work over there. They're at Schneider for a while or some other big company, and then you recruit those drivers to try to pull them into yours. Um, there are some big companies though that are having drivers sign non-competes i've noticed that recently yeah. they have drivers sign non-competes saying if we're going to send it to the school you can't go to another company and then when they try to do so they actually send a letter to the smaller trucking company and threaten to take them to court because they're recruiting drivers and the drivers unknowing to them sign some non-compete that won't let them and there was a court decision that supported this for these large companies so it's one of those where the large companies have an advantage i, I also think it, it depends on the state but uh, let me get it straight so this uh having two companies is just because you are coaching and bringing new new people into the industry and that company same parameters let's say we also we do drive and freight we do that mm -hmm. company does mm -hmm. drive and freight is the coaching aspect and development aspect is that enough to say it is a different company? A hundred percent. So as long as, because I used to be a Fed, as long as you can demonstrate to the government that you have a legitimate business purpose for having a second company in the United States of America, it's not illegal. FMCSA will call you a chameleon carrier. They'll try to link them together if they believe you're only starting the second one to hide from bad CSA scores on the first one. You're only starting the second one because the first one has a conditional or unset rating. Or the first one has a fine and penalty that you didn't pay. Mm -hmm. If there's a blemish on the first company and you try to start a second one, that's when FMCSA is going to have a problem. But starting a second company to develop new drivers has a legitimate business purpose. What would be another example? This. Let's say you have one company that's a rail yard operation. Bunch of intermodal rail yard owner operators running the rail. Well, that's a regional outfit, right? That yeah. stays local, 150 air mile. Then you have another company that does flatbed oversized and they run nationwide. Good luck finding an insurance market that's willing to write both of them. Plus, if you have intermodal local, you might have a market like Acuity Insurance that loves regional operations. They're going to give you better rates, better claims handling, better operational support than a company over here that maybe does flatbed over the road. So would you put an over the road flatbed with a regional intermodal if you can help it? No. no. So you have two different trucking companies, two different insurance companies insuring them. And you think about claims. There are oversized, overweight, flatbed 
insurance companies that specialize in those kind of claims. And then you have over here the rail yard that might specialize in those. So go find a market that specializes in those areas and then have two companies and it makes 100% sense. Well, there we go. Yep. Yeah. See? Do it legally. <laughs> yeah, nothing wrong with it. Just don't do it to hide from the government. You there know. You so hey, look, spending time in the feds, man, not to the same capacity as other people, yeah. but <laughs> you learn a little. You know yeah. how we say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, teams, 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 teams. So I've had situations where guys, you know, great experience, ten years, no claims, no any of that. Mm -hmm. Wants to bring his brother-in-law in or whatever you want to call it, it with no experience, mm -hmm. own authority. What kind of potential risk? Uh, we obviously talked about insurance there, mm -hmm. but hey, not listing them as a driver. Ramifications of that. What would be what would be the best approach? Well, I'll tell you, it goes right back to what we said before. You have this company over here that requires two years of experience. This guy has ten years. He's on the policy for the company that's well established, legit, has good rates, good CSA scores. He wants to bring a brand new driver in. You have to try to add that driver to this insurance policy. That insurance company might say, no, 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 no. You can't add him over here. So we as an agent have to try to convince that company to let us have an exception. Mm -hmm. Maybe they'll let us have one driver if we have like an onboarding program, if we demonstrate the experience of the 10 year veteran. But if that company says absolutely not, we in order to do that are going to have to leave that insurance company or we're going to have to place that brand new driver with the other company that's at that market that lets new drivers. So that development company that we talked about. Mm -hmm. Well, how does the 10 year driver teach him if they work for two different companies? Well, there's two ways. One, you can move the 10-year driver over to the new company to teach them under that company. Another way, which is pretty crazy we talked about, is can a single truck work for two companies around the same time? Yes. So let's say the 10-year guy is working for the established company and finishes a trip, and then he wants to get another trip and have the younger guy drive for the other company. You can lease the truck from the bigger company to the smaller one with a legitimate lease agreement. It'll have registration from the parent. It'll have IFTA from the parent, which is fine. If you qualify the new driver under the new company, this guy just becomes a passenger over here. He's not operating for this company because he works for that one. So you could actually have a senior guy mentor a junior guy and have them work for two different companies if you set it up right. I have a catch. So what about the passenger policy then? While the older guy, senior guy drives. You would need the passenger policy for the senior guy if he's driving along and he's not on the policy of that company. Okay. But to circumvent that, you could add the 10-year guy onto this policy for that week. Gotcha, yeah. And qualify the 10-year driver under both companies. Can a driver work for two companies at the same time? Yeah. Yes. Can you use the single truck and have it run under two companies um, consecutively or, or back to back? Yes. So what's wrong with having drivers qualified for both companies and then you decide, right? Or it wouldn't be both drivers. You'd have the, the one year guy with the new company. You'd have the 10 year guy qualified at both. He could drive under his company whenever he wants. And then he could drive under the other one to mentor him. So now I just have to add guys, mm -hmm. uh, don't do this at home. <laughs> and if you actually doing those high end you know, uh, operations. Yeah. Uh, and you being audited by DOT and don't do it on You're your own. You're going to need a guy call, like Call, call John. <laughs> call John. Because yeah. we were having this conversation earlier today. And I'm like, man, like, good luck explaining that. And he's like, that's why you need me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just come to Trucking Wins. We'll have all the officers come on Trucking Wins and we'll educate them. Yeah, because because yeah. to the level, there's all kinds of level of people in the industry that are watching this. And some of them, you know, this drums because of the question. Some people think it's as easy as... As, oh, just tell me what the price difference is for this one person. They yep. think that the premium is only adjusting for one driver. Yeah, it's it, not. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it might, and it could, let's say they make an exception and they say, we're just going to charge a little more for this one driver exception. But what it might force you to do is leave the good market. 
So you can go to a whole new market that accepts younger drivers. The only problem is you're going to pay more for the other guys. But that's what I'm saying. That's yeah. what I try to explain. You yeah. are, you're going to incur the cost of everyone else because you can't punish the rest of the team and your business just to onboard for a guy that may or may not work out. Yeah, you're, right. Absolutely. you're right. This is why we don't put up with load cancellations. There yeah. we go, guys. One bad guy starts canceling <laughs> yeah. the loads. That actually does affect the good guys. And we talked about a driver working for two companies. Well, then I have to do pr two pre-employments and I need two random programs. Honestly, this book has exceptions for that. Um, do you have to do a pre-employment drug test if you have a guy operating for two companies? The answer is no. Because if he does his pre-employment and he's part of the random and the drug program for this major company, you can actually just grab paperwork from the, the primary company, give it to the secondary one, and now they're exempt from a pre-employment drug test. You can use the random program for this company over here. That's where you need a guy like me just to show you how to comply how with to this how when to you have two people qualify. Yes. Now, now, I will express, before you go beat the shit out of a recruiter with this, yeah, right? Yeah. Just know that the only reason this will work is because you're in control with both companies. 100%. It would be so difficult for me to accept ABC's trucking pre-employment drug screen and I have no contacts or Correct. no control over any yeah. of and their nobody, policies. Nobody is willing to share and so yeah. on. Yeah. I'll tell you, in the industry, with an owner-operator or, or a single truck motor carrier where this exception is used for pre-employment is this. Let's say I have my own trucking company with my own DOT, my own MC, and my own drug testing program. But it's a little slow right now. And a company like yours says, hey, come lease on to us for the next month because we're pretty busy. Mm -hmm. Well, when he comes over, he has the drug records from his own company. So he gives you those. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, good. And if he has a random program and he shares that with you, he can use his own trucking company's random program, his own trucking company's pre-employment, give that to us, and then trip lease over here for, say, a month or three weeks because he's slow and we're not. So I have one question. Yeah. So now for that to happen, uh, it, everything would have to be like extremely professional because where mm -hmm. I see a problem, one of those uh, you know owner operators goes on to join the company with that program and then two weeks later he's gone he's not answering a phone call he's not willing to mm -hmm. provide you anything yep this actually and i'm glad that you brought it that way this says you you have to get all that paperwork before you put them in the truck so you gather it all you yep. put it in the format that this book outlines you already have it in the file if he quits you already gathered but it. The, but then what happens if during uh during that period mm -hmm. he gets selected for uh for a random and let's say mm -hmm. he fails and he never notifies us, us. well you're going to end up doing the pre-employment mm -hmm. and if he failed while he was at his own company you still the pre-employment clearinghouse you still have to do mm -hmm. this exemption is not pre-employment clearinghouse exempt that's just the drug test you still need to bring this guy in and do the clearinghouse check when you hire him for yeah. that trip period now if he's here a year and you just keep him leased on for whenever he jumps in and out of the company well then you'd have to do the annual query and you'd catch him there now with it's new with the clearinghouse it just came out last month if you do a pre-employment query and then he's prohibited after that date they're going to notify you if he had prohibited conduct within the first 12 months of doing the pre-employment query so if i hire you today i do your query you're clear and then you're prohibited because you applied for another job, the clearinghouse is going to send me an email. Hey, remember that guy you just did? You better go check him. Uh, look at that. That wasn't the case until just recently, like March of this year. Okay. Brand new change in the clearinghouse. That makes Because I was already thinking if I had mm -hmm. to backpedal, I can always go on his, on his safer and I would see a ding on the, uh, on, on, alcohol pile, on the alcohol. That's only if he got pulled over. And they check the clearinghouse. Mm -hmm. He can be prohibited in the clearinghouse. And if he didn't get stopped and get caught prohibited, mm -hmm. it's not going to show on his company. So that's why this new change to the clearinghouse is so important. If you run a guy again and it's not prohibited and then he becomes prohibited, they're going to email notify you as long as you did a query within the last year. Really good change that the clearinghouse implemented. Bottom line, kids, don't do drugs. Yeah, right? don't do drugs. Don't drink and drive, <laughs> right? And hey, stay away from the <laughs> CBD oil too. You know how many drivers are testing positive because they're running CBD do, do, oil all over their do, kneecaps? Do you think, so? do, do you think that's real or that's excuse? Yeah. I think that's an excuse. Yeah, I they don't. think it's an excuse, but if you go to the website called Odapsy, O-D-A-P-C, 
Google it. ODAPC, it's the Office of Drug and Alcohol Policy Compliance. Right on the made page, it says CBD notice. You can test positive under the DOT for rubbing CBD on your joints if you're 0.3% THC or higher in that. And they don't regulate this CBD. So everybody out there, if you're be rubbing this CBD lotion on your kneecaps because your joints hurt, you can end up positive on a DOT. So don't do that. Yeah, yep, yep. yeah. I have a question. Like, uh, what what would the company? What should the company do if uh, you know we we do the hours of service auditing, and let's say we see the driver pull up at one of those uh, uh, medical uh, marijuana Dispensary. place, dispensaries, mm -hmm. and. And that's it. There is no other data. There is nothing else mm -hmm. there. What should the company do to keep themselves safe? All right. So here's the deal. Can a driver pull into the parking lot of that place? Yeah. Sure. Can the driver possess it in the truck? Absolutely not. That's a violation of the Green Book. You cannot possess any THC, any illegal marijuana in the truck at all, right? Unless it's part of the manifested load in the trailer and you're hauling marijuana legally as cargo. Same with alcohol. So as long as he doesn't possess it in the truck. Now, number two, he can't consume it either because if he uses a controlled substance, it's prohibited conduct in the book. So why would the driver be there at all? He shouldn't be because you're either going to buy it and possess it or buy it and use it and either case put you in a bad situation. Now, could he go and park, buy it, and give it to a friend or something and they drive away with it, it was never in the truck. It's not possession, you see? Mm -hmm. So are you really going to be able to take action because he was in the vicinity of it? Not necessarily. Now, um, there's something called a SAP. It's a return to duty process. Only prohibited conduct in part 3D2 subpart B of this book prohibits the driver from driving in the future. Possession of marijuana puts him out of service for 24 hours, but does not require a SAP. Usage of marijuana requires a sap and entrance into the clearinghouse. If he simply possesses marijuana, his name ain't gonna end up in the clearinghouse. But if he uses it, it will. What would I do if I suspected usage? I might ask the driver, hey man, did you use? Yeah, I did. Well, that's employee admission in here under 382.121 and that's prohibited and he goes in the clearinghouse. But if you say, hey man, I think you might have possessed. Did you buy any of that and use it? Man, I didn't buy none of that and use it. Well, then it's not driver admission. Then you might say, well, can I test him? You can't. You can't because reasonable suspicion testing in here requires contemporaneous articulable observances of appearance, speech, behavior, odor, right? And if you can't articulate that there was an appearance in some, and they use the words contemporaneous and articulable, if you can't demonstrate that, you're not allowed to do a reasonable suspicion test just because he possessed it or just because you suspected him of possessing does not authorize you to do the test. You need what I just said. But if he had admits it, then that is prohibited conduct. So kind of little twerks and tricks of the mm -hmm. trade if you come across a scenario where you think he might possess or you. So at the end of the day, it's still your decision. Be mm -hmm. careful what you do. Yeah, yeah. But, but so going back a little bit, if he, if he got caught with possession, that will hit my CSA. Of course. Yeah, right? possession would hit your CSA score currently <laughs> under the drug and alcohol basic. Right. Usage, possession, alcohol, CBD that has THC in it, any kind of drugs that hurts your CSA. However... Unless the driver used or tested positive for usage or does something prohibited in subpart B of 382, he's only out of service for 24 hours at the scale per the CVSA out of service criteria. So what does that mean? Driver gets busted with some, you know, some peanut butter squares from, <laughs> from the marijuana place, you know, and it's not a candy bar. You know, it says right on the back, it's THC. And he hasn't consumed any, but he possesses it. They would place you out of out of service at the scale for 24 hours. It would hurt your CSA score for basic and controlled substances, but you would be able to drive away from that facility after 24 hours and you would not need to see a SAP. What, what should the company do to maintain good status with DOT after that happens? I mean, me, if you have a zero tolerance policy for any drug possession or usage, well, then you terminate the driver. Mm -hmm. But if the driver got busted for using and it was prohibited by a SAP, you can't have him drive back to your company. This guy, you could allow him to drive back and then terminate him. So you make sure you get your trailer, your equipment, etc. The only downside is let's say he possessed this peanut butter square 
and then you let him leave after 24 hours and he crashes and kills someone. Uh, How are you going to explain that to the family that this guy possessed marijuana, then crashed? And what if during that crash, we do a post-accident test and he fails it? Oh, man. man. Well, yeah. now we're in trouble. So it's company judgment-wise, if you're a real professional entity and you got a guy with possession and usage, do whatever you can, in my opinion, to get the heck out of your truck and then evaluate it later. And your your path of least resistance is literally to just not employ him anymore. There you go. Yeah. 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 I agree. All right. So um, you got it, kids? So yeah. don't, don't do drugs. Don't do drugs and don't drink, especially if you got an 18-wheeler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So let's go down to the more DOT mm -hmm. driver related topics yeah uh so uh the first one is uh i usually say keep your truck clean look sharp have your paperwork together and for the most part you're gonna be good now what does the ot looks for when making decisions mm -hmm. to inspect the vehicle or the driver well i'll tell you um a lot of agents like insurance agents a lot of these markets they have this system called the iss inspection selection system it's like a red light yellow light green light system if you're green light the inspector is supposed to let you go if you're red light they're supposed to stop you you're yellow that's nah, up to them how many inspectors really use that system few to none why because you'd have to whip out your laptop get it plugged in log in get unlocked get on the internet and as a truck passes you're going to have to type in the dot number like this unless there's a scan which most scales don't have you got to type it in and then it's red and you're like okay pull around what do most inspectors do they just sit there and they make a decision well what kind of truck do i want to inspect you want the reality of it it's this if i want to find violations i'm going to wait for a truck that comes in it has an obvious maintenance issue broken windshield view obstruction dirty truck bald tires maybe some lights aren't working some reflective tape missing a mud flap oh i got you now on a maintenance so i pull you in if you're out on the road unsafe driving is going to get you pulled over speeding falling too close you're in the wrong lane you didn't stop at a scale if drivers would just not do things that are unsafe and get pulled over and make sure their truck is in the top condition possible they likely are never going to get pulled into scale for cause the only other time they'd get pulled in is for a random check right yeah now can an inspector see your logbook until after you're pulled over? No. So do bad logbooks get you pulled over? No. So don't give these officers a reason. Funny story, man, right? There's a lady named Donna. Hey, Donna Rooney, if you're out there, love you. She's retired now. She was my coworker on the Wisconsin State Patrol for years. She'd sit in the back messing around. She'd do a little knitting and crocheting every once in a while. <laughs> Donna. And then, um, and then she'd say, John, if you see a truck with a broken windshield, let me know. So I'd be out there checking trucks out, looking to see, and I'd see one with a broken windshield. I'd be like, Don, I got one. And then I'd pull him around. She might do 100 inspections in a row that all start from a broken windshield. It was her pet peeve, right? So if you were an inspector out there, what would be your trigger? Would it be you don't like seatbelt usage that isn't used? The hands-free cell phone. Maybe you're a cell phone guy. Maybe you're a windshield person. Maybe you love overweight. Another scale story at the Kenosha scale, it's a weigh in motion. So you can weigh the truck as it comes in. There's inspectors sitting in the back. They flip the switch. Trucks are coming in. They ain't even looking at you. And then they hear, Meh, because the beep says you have an overweight truck. Then they run out and pull it around because it's overweight right so the reality is that you want to hear another funny reality about how to get picked <laughs> overtime right so if i'm an inspector and i'm working an eight hour shift and i have three hours and i don't do much i'm on tiktok i'm on your youtube channel <laughs> right i'm just hanging out and then i realize man i gotta get some inspections done it's been three hours so the next truck that comes in i'm looking for the prettiest truck and the prettiest trailer with no violations so i can get the inspection done quick four inspections a day keeps the sergeant away right so um i get that one inspection done maybe i do a couple mediocre ones and then that last inspection to get the fourth one done maybe 45 minutes before my shift's over now i got joe bob the ragman trucker i bring him in with the worst truck i've seen all day and that inspection takes me two hours overtime overtime so what's the reality of these inspections i'm not saying officers milk overtime but they do i'm not saying that they really hate windshields but they do how many use the iss 
anyone can say that it's used, but it's really not. You know, it's a, there's a pretty cool program. Um, FTA does, uh, you get to go to the scale house mm -hmm. and just participate and you're yep. just kind of a fly in the wall. And, and we got the opportunity to do that. And let me tell you that everything that he's saying is, is yep. pretty much on the money and they're supposed to be uh, voluntary inspections. I don't know why that these guys that got put out of service. Okay. We actually have a video if you check it out on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Why in the world would you volunteer for these voluntary inspections? And it was demeanor. There was a guy just coming in mm -hmm. and his face and the mannerism of him driving and weaving and just ignoring people. DOT was just like, yeah, come on. Well, I'll tell you, why would people volunteer to get an inspection? Well, I'll don't tell you. Understand. This, well, <laughs> it, well, here, there's a, there's a positive to it. If your CSA scores, other than unsafe driving and crash in your CSA, the rest of the CSA scores are directly tied to number of inspections. So if you're in an alert for your CSA, so for say hours of service, and you don't have enough inspections and you can get two, three, four clean ones, you can drop out of the alert. You want to hear a crazy story? True story. Tim, Tim out there from Kenosha. I won't say your last name so the state patrol won't go after you. But anyway, Tim <laughs> said, John, I got three trucks. I hired this last guy and he got me two violations for hours of service. Now I'm in the alert and I'm going into my renewal. What can I do? And I went in his CSA and I said, Tim. If you can get two inspections, they're going to take your total points divided by the number of inspections. If you can get two, the way the math problem works, you're going to be out of the alert by your renewal. Oh, John, how do I get those? I said, you can go ask them. So he tried and they said, nope. <laughs> he goes, what do I do now? They won't inspect me. I said, I'm not advocating this. Everybody, I ain't advocating this, but this is what Timmy did. Timmy said, well, what can I do, John? I said, well, you could remove the front plate. You could remove your IFTA stickers. You could remove your name and DOT number mm -hmm. because none of those are CSA related violations. Then so none of your CSA in. score will get up, but you'll get pulled over and get a violation for no front plate, no markings and missing an IFTA sticker. So he took his front plate off, removed his markings and he did NASCAR races around the scale. <laughs> <laughs> he got pulled over twice in one week. And the second guy's like, didn't you get busted for this last week? He goes, yeah, but I need one more inspection. <laughs> so, so did he get two clean hours of service inspections? Yes. Did that get him out of the alert for his renewal? Now we're not advocating violence violating the law to reduce your scores. You might even say, how did this dude drive illegally to get his scores reduced? Yeah, it's the nature of the game, right? Mm -hmm. How do you win at the game called trucking? You learn the game. You learn it from do the DOT not coach. Try, do not try this at home yeah, without, don't try it at home. call John first, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, driver's PSP record effect mm -hmm. on DOT inspections and all right. So, Outcome and overall. So yeah. I'd like every driver to understand you're not going to a trucking company in, in reality and filling out a resume, right? No. You're filling out the trucking company application, which is like pencil whip, pencil whip, right? What is your true resume in trucking? Your MVR? and your PSP, which is called the Pre-Employment Screening Program. Every trucking company can spend $10 and see what you did to your own license for the last three years for violations and five years for crashes. So if you want to keep your record clean, don't get nothing on your MBR and don't get nothing on your PSP. Well, what's the difference, John, right? Well, the MBR is moving violations or CDL-related issues you went and got a citation with and were convicted in court. That's your MBR. Well, I got a bunch of warnings on my MBR is clean. Well, your PSP is not because all your warnings are on your PSP. Does every trucking company get to see both? Yeah. Who else sees both? Officers, yeah. right? Yep. At the scale, an officer can go type in your little driver's license number into the PSP and see everything you did for five and three years. So you think you're hiding with warnings? You ain't hiding with warnings. You know, uh, funny story about that. I have a guy from Jersey actually got fired on his day off. So check this out. He he ran for a company driver position, mm -hmm. has a no cell phone tolerance. He actually his he helps his buddy out with a dump truck mm -hmm. hauling garbage over to uh, the Bronx somewhere. So they cross the Bronx. Mm -hmm. He gets put out of service for his cell phone calling his buddy. Mm -hmm. So when they run a they they run a runs on the PSP. Because they were doing like whatever it is, they do their annual check, yeah. pops on there, and he was put out. He he had the violation under the other guy, come under the other company name, but because it's visible, 
they saw it, it's behavioral, got fired from his company job position. And also, I've seen this like many, many times. The driver comes in, he's like swearing, I have a perfect driving record. Mm -hmm. We pull the MVR, yeah, it's clean, empty. We pull the PSP, and that's a shit show. Yeah, it's a crap sandwich, and yeah. who likes crap sandwiches? And oh, now we tell, yeah. we're telling this guy, man, like we cannot hire you because of all these things that you have done, mm -hmm. and we just refuse to accept that there is such thing as PSP. We're like, no, my record is clean, and we would yeah, argue no, with you. The cop <laughs> so hates hard. Spanish guys, uh, <laughs> or like oh, that's a, a that's a company truck, not my truck, and yep. you you yep. you pre tripped it. So here we go. So you figure the, two entities are gonna are gonna see your PSP again. It's gonna be the employers that you're gonna apply at in the future, like you just said, and it's going to be the state patrol guys. One question a lot of people wonder is, do the insurance companies see the PSP? Yeah, and they do not. Right, but we have access to the to yeah. the company CSA records. Yes, but here's the thing: the, the insurance company will have access to the CSA records, but it won't have the driver's name on it. The PSP is for the company, and the company can't give the PSP yeah. to the insurance company. You run a trucking company; you've never been asked for PSPs no. at your renewal, so the insurance company doesn't see the PSPs, but your future employers do, and so do officers. So, if you want to keep your resume clean. Keep your MVR clean and keep your PSP clean because it'll follow you for a long time and hurt your employability, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the tide shifts in that situation where guys, some guys have three pages long, man. I kid you not. And, and all of a sudden they are no longer marketable. Yep. And to talk about what the scenario you gave, remember you said that they ran a PSP, they hired a guy and then they ran another one on him while he was employed. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad the company was proactive there, but guess what? It ain't legal. You're mm -hmm. not allowed to run a pre a pre employment screening program after you hire them. If you read the consent form for the yeah. PSP, yeah. it actually says in there that this is for pre employment. You will not run a driver's PSP throughout the year. So even though that company caught something and took action, the driver could have said, "You violated my agreement." See, but then that yeah. goes back to what Mike says. Yeah. Then they got the information from somewhere else. Yeah. Something tipped them off if they're if that's not their business practice. Yeah. Or that could, that could also be like I, I I when I talk to the dispatchers, I say, look, mm -hmm. you hear something problematic? Let me know. See something? Say. Because yep. like I'm like, if you see the driver all of a sudden waking up in the middle of the night, driving around some local neighborhood, and then going back to the truck stop an hour later, and it's not around his house, it's like anywhere he goes. I want to know about it because that's the beginning of something very bad potentially. Mm -hmm. And I want to know. I want to pay, pay attention to it. Oh, yeah, but here we go. Then. Employees but, should keep their but, then, the but then it must have been the annual because a cell phone is a moving violation. Would, would, yep. It would pop in his it MBR. It could have been that. If it wasn't the PSP that they ran when they shouldn't have, it could have been that old document called the Certification of Violations. Yeah. So every year a trucking company used to have to run an annual MBR to see what popped up on there, do an annual review and fill out a form, and then they needed to have the driver sign a Certification of Violations. Interesting for everybody here, May of last year, they got rid of the requirement for the certification of violations, no longer required. So annually, you used to have to do annual MBR, annual review of the entire file and the certification of violations. We asked the driver, mm -hmm. no longer have to do that last piece. You still have to do the first two, but not that last one. They got rid of it. So what about if the uh, if, uh, driver says, hey, can you check my PSP out? Can I give him some sort of uh, like consent form and pull the PSP? If you go to the if you go to the PSP website, trucking companies can pull the PSP. Do you know who else can pull their PSP? Oh, the driver. driver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you tell them, listen, man, I ain't pulling your PSP. I'm only allowed to do it when I hire you. But here's the website. Go ahead, pull your own. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, that and then if he wants to share it with you, he can absolutely share it with you. All right. But to run another one after you already ran the first one on pre-employment, technically, when you read the document, you're asking supposed to do that mm. all right there, there, we go. Go. there we go all right so any behavior aspect that can help the outcome of inspection i always say uh attitude is a is a very mm -hmm. big one because in many many cases it starts with a with a driver mm -hmm. i've seen some mm, dot officers on the mm -hmm. scales that are not having a good day yeah but with a good attitude for the most part you get them to be at least like okay and like my outcomes were always positive 
Well, I'll tell you, I have a slide in my driver meetings that I do at Trucking Winds and to my customers, and it's a slide, how to handle a roadside inspection. And the number one thing on the list is be nice, right? <laughs> yeah. These cops have egos. I used to be one, right? And you never know when you're going to run into that one. So if you just be nice, put them up on the pedestal. Even if you don't think they belong there, put them up there. You act stupid, <laughs> treat them like they're smart, and just be nice. So... um that's that's the first step. The second step is I ask a lot of drivers, how many times you've been pulled over? And they'll say, oh, never. Once in five years. You don't have the experience, but your safety team does, right? So when you get pulled over, if you get an opportunity, call the safety department. They'll help guide you through and what to expect. You're inexperienced in doing this. Call the resources at your company and have them work through it with you. So be nice. Call us. We'll try to help you. What's the next one? It's an interesting little caveat. When we crash our trucks, do we take pictures? Yeah. Do. yeah. When we crash our trucks, do we take videos or hope we have videos? Yes, yeah. Sir. Yeah. Why do we do that when we crash our trucks? For claims handling, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, we want to handle the claim to, to prove protect ourselves. for innocent, to yeah. protect yourselves, to demonstrate that you didn't do this wrong, right? So when we get roadside inspections and the officer says we did something wrong, what stops you from taking a picture? taking a video but now you might be like well that officer gonna be pissed at me i got a trick for you you say officer it is company policy that if you write a violation on this inspection i'm required to take a photo of it can you show please i'm stupid can you please 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 can you show me right can you show me what's wrong so i can tell my safety department because if i don't give them the picture i'm gonna get in trouble and i'll tell you they told me that what you said isn't right but i know you're right and they're stupid so can you like show me in the book so I can take a picture of that page so when I get questioned by my owner and safety, I can say, look right here. He said, this is what I did wrong. And here's the picture. Mm -hmm. Now, why are we really doing that? Because we know he's stupid and we know we're right. We want evidence and photos of what we're going to do in a challenge later to get that violation removed. Are we going to tell him that? You're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. No, Let me no, take a no, picture. No. That's not, that's the nice part, right? So be nice, put them on a pedestal, act stupid, blame your safety department, take pictures, right? You let the facts do and, the talking. And you got the fa let the facts do the talking and you can present that and do data cues. I win data cues all the time. So we have this one right here, a little picture of a, a brake hose and we had an inspection, right? Well, this office, this driver was good. We got busted for a chafing brake hose and he took a picture to show there wasn't a reduction in the hose diameter, right? Well, there's this operational policy 15 on the internet tells inspectors that if you don't have a reduction in the hose diameter and there's no exposed cords, that it's not chafing anymore. Back in the day, if it was rubbing on the deck, chafing, but not anymore. It can be rubbing on stuff and you don't get violation under that operational policy. So then we'd have a copy of the picture and we also have the inspection and we have both of them so we can do a data queue. In this particular case, the officer took the hose and bent it and saw exposed cord in a little crack. So that ain't the hose diameter. They're supported there because they said you could ex you could see the mm -hmm. fabric layer when he took the hose and bent it. So a good driver will check the hose the whole way. But this driver did good. He took a picture of the hose, took a picture of the inspection, communicated with us. He was wrong, but he at least gave us the evidence so we could support our decision as to whether to do a data queue. So mm -hmm. here we go. So now let, let, let just uh, let just go over this inspection because yeah. uh, uh, there is uh, there is one about the medical card here. It's the, the middle one. Yeah, there's. Uh, I'll yeah. tell you. So for the group, we got a roadside inspection out of Pennsylvania. Driver had this hose that when you twisted it, it showed the fabric layer. Well, we've got photos to show that that's the case. So we can't dispute that one, but we did get a ticket. If you get this ticket reduced or dismissed, reduced to a lesser charge mm -hmm. or dismissed in court, we can do a data queue and remove this violation. Even though the hose was wrong, we can still get it removed if we get a citation and go to court. If this hose was a warning, then it's going to stay in our CSA scores for two years in the maintenance category, yes? Yep. But a ticket, we can go to court. So good. I'm not saying it's good we got a ticket, but we got a ticket. <laughs> the next one is 
state registration is expired. Well, it wasn't expired. We just didn't have the certificate in the truck. We sent it at the time of the inspection, but they still said it was expired, even though it wasn't. So we can challenge that in a data queue or a court and say, hey, we want this changed to not having proof, not that it was expired, less of a ticket amount, right? There's a second ticket. The good thing about the registration is it doesn't hurt our CSA score. None of the CSA scores are affected by a registration issue because they consider it non-safety related. Third one, driver didn't possess his medical card. It didn't say his medical was expired. It just said he didn't possess it. You Google, go to FMCSA and say, does a driver have to possess a medical card? There's a question right on there that says, nope. Since 2015, you no longer have to possess a medical we, we card. We tested that. Yeah, we tested it. We checked it out. We got that printed. So there's three tickets here. We need to arm our attorney with this document saying you don't need a medical card. We need to arm our attorney with the valid registration saying it wasn't expired. And then we need to arm our attorney saying, hey, we were wrong, but just try to get that dismissed. If we can get all three of these dismissed, they all go away. If we can get two of them dismissed and keep one, then it's, that it's one hurts us. It's, it's better. better. It's still a better day. Yeah. Now, which one should we do? We should try to keep the registration proof because it doesn't hurt our CSA score and try to get rid of the DQ filed a driver unsafe one and the maintenance one. If we can reduce our CSA score by getting these two dismissed and agree to pay a fine for the registration, albeit not expired possession, that's how you handle this. So you get a good attorney, you go to court, you challenge the tickets, you do a data queue. That's CSA management. And I'll tell you, many companies fail in that arena. Yes, because I think uh, the big difference between the what John is saying and uh, you know some experiences that I have been through uh, is knowledge. Because mm -hmm. once you know those things, you can address the data queue directly with specific regulation of yep. FMCSA 100%. instead of just like well it wasn't our fault and please 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 please, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> remove it <laughs> yeah if I had if I had five bucks for every time I heard I saw a data queue please remove this this is going to hurt my company well no crap it's going to hurt your company you shouldn't have done it now I'll tell you one data queue that I win on a regular basis is English speaking right ah. and this is very interesting I have a memo which is available on Trucking Winds, and I'll give it I to you it. guys. I think I saw it. Yeah, and there's a memo that says, if you can't speak or read English, but you can communicate well enough to complete the inspection, you shouldn't be violated. And it says that you can use tools to facilitate that communication. Google Interpreting Translate. services, apps, you know, like language apps on your phone. So if you have any driver that is questionable English speaking, you should get the memo. Mm -hmm. that says English speaking can use tools and you should set up some kind of service for that driver to use if he gets pulled over so you don't get the violation. And you don't even need service because Google, Google Translate Correct. is actually pretty mm -hmm. good Yeah, and uh, it's free. Mm -hmm. And if your driver's smart enough, you know, he might not be able to tell him, but he can show him the memo. Huh? And then he Google translates and says, I have a memo. It says I can use Google Translate. What do you want but from is me? Is that an escalation? No, I mean, if he acts stupid, remember, you got to be nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stupid. I don't know how to speak English. Please so you, help no, me, then, right? Por favor, por favor. Por favor. <laughs> <laughs> Senor. Uh, si. <laughs> All right. So um, now... What about uh, multiple violations mm -hmm. under one problem? I've seen to where there is, let's say, the mm -hmm. tire issue, and it's listed on like five mm -hmm. different uh, areas. The same thing, just different verbiage, different, uh, mm -hmm. I guess, thing applied or whatnot. Well, I'll tell you this. FMCSA completely understands what you just said is a problem. A perfect example is this. If you have a steer tire that's bad, that's less than 430 seconds on a steer tire. If you have a drive tire that's bad, that's less than 230 seconds. That's two different tire violations. Yes. Then you might have another tire that's flat. So then they get you for flat. Another one would expose cords. You could get three or four tire violations. And some might call that stacking, but they're different codes, right? Same thing with light bulbs. 
clearance lights, um, they may do that. Now, the only time they don't stack and hurt your score is if the code is the same. If you have like, if you have like this one right here, 396-3A1B, 396-3A1B, both codes are the same. One will hurt your score. The other one won't. But if the code's on there once, the problem is the tire codes, 430 seconds code is different than 230 seconds code. Mm -hmm. So it hits you both. Man, but this is almost the same. Yeah, but it's not it, the same. It's not it the same, but it's almost the same. It says 396 3 one BOS, right? Breaks out of service. So because the BOS is on the same numerical code, both will hurt you because it's a different violation uh. code. So that's how it is now. And you could call that stacking. You know, one pigtail not working, they break all the lights in and it hurts you worse than if they just say lights don't work because of the pigtail, right? Yeah. So I'll tell you, FMCSA has recognized there's a problem. This is a good lead into what's going on in the industry right now. There is a proposal to revise CSA scores. It came out February 15th, 2023. They're taking comments right now on the website through May of 2023. So we got about 45 days to invoke change in the CSA scores. They're proposing seven changes and we need to read those changes, understand what they are and make proper comments so we can possibly affect um, the change that's, that we're facing because it's going to affect all of us, right? If you don't know what's coming, well, that's a problem. Well, what you talked about is stacking several violations in the same category. FMCSA realized that's a problem. I said there's seven changes possibly coming. One of them addresses what you just said. They're planning to take 973 specific CSA violations and group them into 116 groups. So in one group, it's just going to be bad tires. So they won't break each tire into a separate code. It's just going to be bad tires. Another one might be bad lights. Form and manner with logbooks, mm -hmm. bill of lading, trailer number, coded separately right now. They're going to call nice it form and manner. Nice. So they're moving 973 different coded violations into 116 groups. Of the seven changes, do I like that one? Yes. I think that's absolutely fair to give like violations one effect instead of officers breaking them all in and stacking them up just to mm -hmm. add points to our system. So great question, and there's an answer. They know it's a problem, and they're recommending a change that we may see this summer. By, by the way, we're going to put the link in the, in the mm -hmm. video description. Make sure you go, make sure you comment, yeah. make sure you're professional about it. Remember, you have to be a nice guy. You got to read all seven of these changes. Yeah, before you do. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. there is one of them. <laughs> all right. So now, um, warnings versus tickets. I've seen this again and again and again. Mm -hmm. Driver gets a warning for speeding and now he's doomed. So, so here's the thing. If you get a warning for speeding... Let's just use both of you as an example. Mm -hmm. You speed 11 to 14, you get a citation. You speed 11 to 14, you get a warning, right? Both of them, 11 to 14 currently, are seven points in our CSA score. So your ticket and your warning hurt us the same. For how long? Two years. You got it? That's how yep. long it sits in our system. Both got the same violation. You got a ticket. You got a warning. It both hurts us the same. However, if you go to court... And you get that ticket reduced to a parking violation. The seven points that mm -hmm. you're hurting us goes to one point because you got it reduced. His seven stay because it's a warning. Your seven go to one because you got your ticket reduced. If you get it dismissed with no court costs, it goes from seven to zero. So if if you get a speeding, what's better, a ticket or a warning? A ticket. A ticket, sure. always. A ticket yeah. is better for the trucking company because they have a possibility of going to for court. For a driver too? Well, maybe not. You have a warning. He's got a ticket. If he goes to court and it does not get dismissed, goes on his MVR, it doesn't go on yours. So getting a... But it goes on your PSP though. Yeah. Yep, so. But it goes on your PSP. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so a driver's kind of in a catch-22. He wants the ticket to go to court to, to try to fight on behalf of the company, but he may not want the ticket because he doesn't want a conviction to end up on his MVR. But if he goes to court with a ticket and gets it dismissed, it also leaves his PSP. So you see, he's got to balance this. Yeah. Do I want to help the company 
but I'll but I'd rather have a warning to keep it on my PSP, or do I rather have a ticket help the company get it reduced or dismissed? It goes off my MVR and gets removed from my PSP. I think the the real benefit would be to actually get a ticket, assuming yep. that you can actually go through the system and kind of yep. dismiss it, or or reduce to something else. Yep. And in that case, you're saving your PSP and your driving record. Yeah, because yep. here we go. If we're if we're going to talk about usually this is going to 25 and over. Mm -hmm. That's what insurance is going to have, or 15 and over for yeah, a lot of insurance. Turns yeah, into reckless 15, driving. Yep. 15 and over. So even if it's on a PSP, that's still, you still may not be hired. Well, you won't be hired by the trucking company, but if it's on your PSP, the insurance company would never see it. Okay. Where if it's on your MVR, the insurance company would see it. So I, I'm not here just to be like pro carrier. I'm telling you, the driver, no, no, yeah, you, no, no, yeah. you, you have a, you're, you're in a catchy situation. If you get the speeding ticket, and you get it reduced or dismissed, then that's the best of all worlds. Yes. Help the company, help the driver. If you get the warning, it hurts the company still and still hurts your PSP. The only thing you're protecting is your MVR. Now, I have a guy that does tickets. You get a citation, you send him the citation, he hires the attorney, goes to court, does the data queue, does it all for you. It's a guy named Brian Shannon, hell of a guy, right? I send my tickets to him at Trevi Pay, Open Road. Go check him out. Well, anyway, he does that. He has a about a 90% success rate in ticket dismissal or reduction. Mm -hmm. And with the break hose, even though we got a ticket and we're guilty, he could still possibly get that dismissed with negotiation with an attorney, even though we're guilty, you see? So that's the difference in tickets and warning. But mm -hmm. regardless, does it hurt our score either way? Yep. Yeah, so what's the best thing? Don't get any violation, right? Stay yeah. clean and legal. Absolutely. So I have one that's very, very difficult subject to me uh, because I dealt with this very recently and I hate this, but again, that's part of what they do. So mm -hmm. that's part of my business. Hours of service violations discovered by safety uh, personnel. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, once those hours are, they send those the re request of a driver to accept those hours mm -hmm. if he wasn't logged in into unit or something. Then once the driver accepts those hours, we cannot dispatch them per company policy unless we do. Once we do accept that, let's say that was a long weekend and now he has like multiple, like three, four violations during a weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, those viola violations are there in red. Mm -hmm. But now he is good to go. Like he has plenty of hours legally, even right after now, those right violations. Mm -hmm. So what can the company or the driver mm -hmm. do now that we know about it? We made the driver yeah. to accept it. We wrote him up. Mm -hmm. Can we do anything for him to not get it? Um, Short answer is no. Okay. So. Right? so here's how it works. You're talking about the driver presents a log to you that is false. Yes. It's a false logbook. If the officer at the roadside sees that logbook where he made some trips that aren't in his logbook, right? Mm -hmm. It's a false log. But then you go in and suggest he accept those because you know it's him. Yes. He accepts those. The log is no longer false. So that's good. Mm -hmm. We don't get the false log at roadside but no now more. now it's violations. But now it's violations. Well, at roadside, if an officer finds a false log and it's to uncover violations, he gives you both. Right. Mm -hmm. So what you've basically accomplished is he can only write us for the over hours. Now the false goes away at least. Right. So it's better at roadside. Now is the log over hours? Yes. Is he over hours at the time of the stop? No, it was three days ago. They can write you up for these violations, but they can't place you out of service. Because mm -hmm. you have a demonstrated 10 hour break, so you can't get shut down. They can write you up, but you'll continue to truck. You see, yes. if it was false the other day, they can shut you down. So it's still better to suggest have them accept them to get rid of the false, have the over hours. If it was a couple days ago, you're not going to get shut down. Now, I do have a trucking company in California, all owner operators, right? If you have any violations in your log today or the previous seven days, guess what they do? Three they to four hours or something. Not enough, because it's still in there. They sit you until they fall off. Oh, wow. so, oh, yep. Four, we, we assigned the trip. Four days ago, you're showing over. You're off for four days. Because after the fourth day, they log in. These are no longer there at roadside. Well, so, but let me tell you. So your punishment is whenever you did this impropriety, you're off that many days for that to clear out of your logbook. But, but it's also 
very, very financial decision yeah. because the hours of service violation in California versus hours of service violation in around here is like night and day in California. That's like 2,500 bucks. Yeah, they charge more money because wow. all these tickets are predicated by the state you know, yeah. ticket program or how much they want to violate you for. It's federal law, but the federal government doesn't care how much money a state charges you for violating because you adopt the federal regulation into state law. So moral of the story here is if it's in the logbook is over hours today or the previous seven days, that officer can put it on your CSA and it's a dangerous thing. How do you make it so they can't? Look at today in the previous seven days, don't have anything wrong with it, right? Yeah. And if there is anything, get them to fix it now, like form and manner, bill of lading, stuff mm -hmm. like that. But in your case, once you accept them trips and it puts you over hours, you're either subject to it or you're going to have to wait for that to clear out before you give them another loan. All right, gotcha. So it kind of stinks, but it, maybe it's not practical in the real world. But that's what a couple companies do, and it's a hard decision, you know? It, it is. But once when it's 2500 bucks per infraction, it's not so hard decision anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll tell you, some companies, the CSA effect can be way more than 2,500 bucks in the cost of insurance, right? Yeah, if you have yeah. an alert, oh, yeah, in, but... if you have an alert in your hours of service CSA, or if you have an alert and you're trying to get brokered freight, they won't give you the loads. They won't, and you get worse insurance, way more than a $2,500 ticket. So let, let's try to break the, 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 the false here, or I don't know if that's false or not. ELD disconnects. Uh, a lot of drivers think that if we disconnect the ELD, then reconnect it, then nobody can see anything, even though on the internal system, on the auditing end, mm -hmm. we actually do see it. We can recreate the path and everything else. Mm -hmm. Now, what... What does what does DOT see once uh, driver sends that report out to the to the DOT? All right. So e every ELD has something called an ERODS data transfer file. A legitimate ELD is supposed to capture all activity for that vehicle and that driver logged in for today and the previous seven days, and that file will go to the officer's computer. He'll open up his computer, he'll upload the file, and he'll actually read and look what the log look looks from the data. It doesn't matter what the driver's screen looks like. Whatever his screen looks like doesn't matter because all the data has been captured in the ERODS file and it gets sent to the officer. So if a driver's like, well, I'm going to get rid of this ELD and they're not going to see what I did the last seven days. <laughs> Once the ELD is connected and transfers it, it's they'll see everything that occurred those last days under that driver login because of the ERODS transfer file. And if someone wants to see what this looks like, actually on the government website, they have the software program for ERODS. Mm -hmm. You can take a data file from your from your ELD vendor, have them send it to you and upload it in there and see what ERODS looks like for your logs. So you can actually see what the officer sees. The program is available online. A lot of people don't realize that. Yeah. So uh, I actually... I think that that part of the issue is like legit. Uh, the last thing that I wanna that I wanna ask is uh, personal convenience. I'm pretty sure John has an extensive video about that mm -hmm. on his website. I do. So personal conveyance is one of the most misunderstood things out there. What is personal conveyance? It's legally driving a truck in the off-duty status. Mm -hmm. I'll say it again. It's driving a truck on a road legally, driving it down the road in the off-duty status. Um, I know that this is a great podcast with the YouTube channel. I was on a YouTube thing with Mother Trucker. You can check that out. We saw has it. A, <laughs> yeah, it has a lot of video hits. And um, on Trucking Wins, truckingwins.com, I have a 27-minute personal conveyance video that I think every driver should watch. Uh, uh, if you're uh, a member of Trucking it. Wins, you can check it out. But there are really four ways where personal conveyance can be used legit. And it's outlined directly in a document. You come to Trucking Wins and you can see an in-depth explanation of those four things. Um, in summary, what is it? Number one, if you're on an off-duty period, you can use personal conveyance to go to a restaurant and entertainment. Those are the two words. You remember those two words? Number one, you're on a 10-hour break, 34-hour restart, 30-minute break. You can use PC to go to a restaurant and entertainment. Case closed, done, no questions asked. Number two, um, your residence. You can only go to and from your residence from a terminal or a drop lot. If you're at the company terminal, drive home. If you're home, drive back to the company terminal, fine. If you're at a trailer drop lot for the company, 
drive home. You're home, drive back to the trailer drop lot. Can you go from terminal to trailer drop lot under PC? No. Can you go from drop lot to terminal? No. But can you go from terminal to residence, residence to terminal, drop lot to residence, residence to drop lot? Absolutely yes. Well, John, what if I have a load? PC doesn't matter if you have a load. If you're loaded, you can go to a restaurant entertainment. If you're loaded, you can go from the terminal to your home and vice versa, right? So that's you, a, Even if that advances the, the load? Yep, and I'll tell you, that's interesting. Remember I talked about a federal register? Mm -hmm. When they proposed the personal conveyance back in the day, a couple years ago, they said you can't advance the load. The final regulation guidance, they removed the term can't advance the load. Can you advance the load? Yes. It doesn't say anywhere in the guidance that advancing the load is not legit. Example, I'm at the terminal. Mm -hmm. I'm fully loaded. I live right there, but my delivery is further down the road, maybe five, six hours. Can I drive towards the delivery as long as I'm going to my residence from a terminal? Yes. 100% yes. So one, restaurant entertainment. Next one, residence. Third one, after you load and unload, you can go to a nearby reasonable safe location, first one available. So if I load and unload here, I have to go to the closest truck stop. If I get to the closest one, it's full. It's no longer reasonable. Take pictures, take videos, go to the next closest. Does that mean I can load and unload and pass up 78 truck stops, almost run out of hours, <laughs> and then go, PC? No, that, <laughs> that's not PC. That's bad planning, right? So, so that's three. And the last one's a safety official. Any kind of security guard, lot attendant, police officer, you're parked on a non-ramp, and he says, you can't park on this on-ramp. You need to move. You can push PC and go find another spot because a safety official told you to move. So that's the four. Other than those four, now I know I went through them real quick. There's a lot more on there. Like I said, we can do a future podcast, go through them in depth or go to Trucking Wins and sign up. I'll tell you, there's a lot of videos on there and I'm just here to try to help you. You know, these are the things we need to do to gain that knowledge. You said walk through the door, learning something, leave being a better truck driver or owner than you were when you came in, you know? Yeah. All right. So uh, I guess that could conclude the podcast for today. Uh, yep. We hope to see John sometime soon around here. Uh, but All right, guys, we hope you enjoyed the video. It was definitely very uh, informative and entertaining to us. Yeah, and eye-opening for those who don't know and, and were confused on some things. Uh, these videos are excellent for owner-operators looking to expand their business. That's what we do is put good content in front of you uh, so you can further develop your business. Absolutely. And if you are an owner-operator looking to grow your business, or perhaps you're a driver looking to buy your first truck and build your, build your trucking empire, give us a call. 863-342-5171. We're located right here in Lakeland, Florida. There we go. And we got equipment ready to rock and roll, ready to do some business with you guys. So give us a call, 863-342-5171. Absolutely. Guys, you only need a truck, work ethic, and a dream.